Hello and welcome to this lecture wherein we shall begin our derivation of the equation of uh, linear momentum or uh, new the application of Newton's second law to a continuum fluid. So the linear momentum equation. Now in the previous lecture we had developed uh, some basic machinery uh, involving uh, uh, which based on the understanding of the relationship between Eulerian coordinates and material coordinates. We saw how we could express the material derivative that is the rate of change as we move along with a material point that moves with the fluid. Uh, we saw how to express that in terms of uh, the Eulerian frame. Uh, we also saw how to express the material derivative of uh, uh, the sum of any quantity within a moving control volume uh, using the Reynolds transport theorem. So now we shall apply those ideas uh, as we seek to develop the linear momentum equation for a material volume of fluid. So if you think back to the way we derive the conservation of mass of the continuity equation, we start by applying the basic principle to a moving material volume. So just to fix the idea clearly in our mind, here is our material <coughs> excuse me. Yes, here is our material volume, and this material volume has uh, an area AM and a volume VM, uh, both of which are functions of time, of course. All right, so focusing attention on this material volume, uh, in words, the statement of uh, Newton's second law applied to such a volume, which was actually first uh, enunciated by Euler, essentially states that the rate of change of the total linear momentum now later we shall look at uh, the implications of the law of moment of momentum or rotational momentum later on so that's why right now we are considering only linear momentum which is uh, analogous to the law f is equal to ma in classical point mechanics Whereas uh, a balance of moment of momentum would involve uh, forces or uh, would involve torques and uh, moments of forces, that is, torques and uh, uh, angular momentum. All right, so right now we're dealing with linear momentum. So the statement is that the rate of change of the total linear momentum of this material volume must be equal to the sum of forces acting on Vm. So when I say sum, I mean the net, so that the mutual forces acting uh, due to pieces of fluid acting on other pieces of fluid within the volume will cancel out. So we are only interested in the net of forces. Alright, so this sum of forces uh, will have two contributions because one can identify two types of forces. So we would have uh, body forces which take the form of uh, dimensions of force per unit volume and we would have surface forces which is of course uh, of the form first force per unit area or another word for this is stresses and this includes pressure but it also includes other components if the fluid has viscosity all right, so we shall deal with uh, those details as we go along. But this is the broad uh, uh, principle in words. Now we have to see how we can write, translate uh, this equation, which I have written in words, into mathematics using the ideas that we developed uh, earlier in the previous lecture. All right, so how do we write the rate of change of the total linear momentum? Well, remember, it's the rate of change as this material volume moves along with the flow. So clearly it should be the material derivative of the total linear momentum. So we have to integrate over the volume to momentum rho, sorry, rho v 
this integrated over the volume of course uh, this volume is a function of time this we know right and this must be equal to now the total contribution of body forces so body forces include things like um, uh, certainly the gravitational force but you also have electromagnetic forces uh, in this course we will only focus on gravitational uh, uh, forces although the same idea can be extended in other fields like magneto hydrodynamics all right so just thinking about gravity here the total sum of body forces is the integral over the volume again times in this case uh, this is the mass uh, per unit volume and g the acceleration due to gravity right so that gives us the sum of gravitational forces acting on the body and now plus we have the all the effect of all the surface forces so one of the main sticky points in the derivation of this equation or the application of uh, newton's equation to a continuum amount of fluid is how to deal with this surface force term in fact it took a long time for people to realize that uh, there were actually such forces acting in the first place because you see newton had enunciated his idea for a mass point uh, which has no surface so the unique force he considered was a body force now and that too where the entire body was represented by its center of mass but when you consider a finite amount of fluid people realized that in addition to body forces like gravity uh, the fluid would also exert uh, stresses on neighboring uh, volumes of fluid and that those stresses would be exerted uh, in proportion to the surface uh, that was shared by the two pieces of fluid so uh, this thought came out of uh, various uh, uh, considerations of specific problems for example uh, just to uh, motivate our consideration of surface forces think about a classic problem which occupied uh, uh, the masters including the bernoullis and euler and uh, cauchy after him so you think about flow in a pipe right and today we know that uh, you have a velocity profile look, that looks something like this but even before uh, anyone could calculate uh, the velocity profile which would require all these equations to be known what they did know was that there was a certain uh, let's say mean velocity of the flow and what uh, people began to think about especially euler was that if you take a small piece of fluid here Uh, let's say a fluid bounded by this imaginary surface and he asked himself the question what would be the forces experienced by this volume of fluid and it seemed clear to him that this volume of fluid had to be pushed along by the fluid outside it and that's what gave to the idea of surface forces that might be acting on this small piece of fluid now uh, because that's exactly how force would be transmitted through the fluid say from a pump here that is connected to a piston that actually drives the flow uh, the transmission of force has to take place and uh, people realize that that has to happen uh, through the exertion of uh, a surface force or a stress uh, but it wasn't yet clear how to write such a force uh, euler was able to do this in the limited case where he only considered pressure that acts normal to surfaces however the the general uh, statement about surface forces which uh, can be tangential to a surface certainly that's the nature as we know now of shear stresses that is the drag force exerted by the wall which retards the fluid is a tangential force not a normal force like pressure so in general the surface force that, that is exerted upon a surface uh, can have an arbitrary orientation relative to the surface and the general statement uh, or the general way to express such surface forces had to await cauchy who wrote down his stress principle which is essentially what we are going to write now uh, for the sum of surface forces so what he says was that the net surface forces acting on a material volume can be represented as an integral over the surface of the material volume and he represented the surface stress that is the force per unit area at any point on the surface as a vector t so this t we shall call the stress vector 
So the idea is that at every point on the material volume, there will be a vector t which represents the surface force acting on that volume. So for the moment, let's assume that we know what this is, although uh, specifying this is a major difficulty. But okay, assuming that such a quantity exists uh, and its definition indeed is precise, then we can represent the surface forces in this manner. Uh, this representation is the Cauchy stress principle. Now you might wonder what about the forces, internal stress forces acting between uh, volumes of material and other volumes uh, within the material volume. Well, it turns out that uh, we are only interested of course in the net force and all internal stresses would uh, cancel each other out by Newton's third law of equal and opposite uh, action and reaction. So that when you sum over everything, you are only interested in uh, the forces that the external fluid exerts upon uh, this material volume that we are considering. By the way, the very idea of uh, considering a portion of fluid within a larger fluid domain and asking what stresses act upon it and using that principle to develop uh, the governing equations is due to Euler. All right, carrying on. So now uh, we have uh, a statement, uh, a mathematiz mathematization of our uh, linear momentum principle. However, we have uh, several uh, steps to make before things get clarified. Uh, firstly, we need to, we would like to bring in this time derivative into the volume integral, but we already know how to do this via, of course, uh, Reynolds transport theorem. So, using Reynolds transport theorem, we can rewrite this term as the integral over the volume. local derivative to v plus the divergence of rho v which is the quantity of interest times v. Yes and this must be equal to this carrying over from the top. v plus the surface force. All right, so we made some progress. So now you see that uh, we have three of the terms or rather these two terms written entirely in terms of a volume integral. And again, thinking back to the way we derived the mass conservation equation, our objective now will be to, let me expand this. Yes, our objective now will be to somehow write this surface integral as a volume integral. And then we can bring it all under a single volume integral appeal to the fact that the volume we selected is arbitrary and then obtain a point wise partial differential equation uh, for the velocity field. But uh, standing in the way of this uh, general program is our ability to write the surface integral as a volume integral which requires us to understand more about this uh, stress vector. Okay, uh, So the first thing to ask is what could this stress vector depend on? So what does T depend on? Well, uh, let's go back to the idea of uh, a pipe flow. Uh, moreover, let's assume that the pipe has a varying cross section. So now clearly, uh, if I have a mat material volume here, the surface forces acting on this material volume should certainly depend on where this material vo volume is located in general. So certainly T should depend on the spatial position. Uh, just like the velocity does, just like uh, the density in general may, of course for a continuum fluid, for a compressible, incompressible fluid it won't. But uh, just like any field, the stress vector uh, should depend on position in general. But in addition, it has a peculiar dependence which is uh, a peculiar or special aspect of uh, stress uh, of stresses that this stress vector will also depend on the orientation of the surface of the material volume uh, at that point x. 
So what do I mean by that? Consider this uh, material volume and let's say we have uh, flow in this fashion. Now it seems clear that if you look at a surface that is perpendicular to the flow, the pressure that it feels or in general the stress it feels would be different from uh, this, a part of the material volume whose surface is tangential or, or rather yeah, tangential to the flow. In fact, from what we already understand about pipe flow, we know that uh, um, the major stresses that the normal, uh, normally oriented surface would experience would be pressure. Whereas the major stress that the tangentially oriented surface it would experience would be a shear stress that would arise only if the fluid has viscosity. So clearly, even if we knew nothing about this, but we had some general feeling about uh, uh, flow in a pipe and a myriad other situations, uh, we would re recognize that this uh, stress in general uh, should clearly have a dependence on the orientation of the surface and that orientation can be represented through the unit normal vector. Because in general the orientation of a, a surface, uh, at least locally, where it can be represented by an infinitesimal plane, can be given by the uh, orientation of the normal vector. So we will say that the stress vector depends on position as well as orientation of the surface as represented to, through the unit normal. All right. So this was also realized uh, by Euler, but the major difficulty he had was how to express this general dependence. So in Euler's case, he did uh, uh, the simpler situation where he assumed that the stress vector is always directed along the normal. That is that a surface only experiences normal forces, which are the pressure forces. But such a thing, of course, would not help us describe the drag experienced by a fluid uh, from the neighboring walls, because that force is not is tangential to the surface. And so it, this is, it was Cauchy's brilliance to generalize this idea and uh, first of all say that the stress should have arbitrary dependence on n, it need not be normally directed to the surface. And then also to figure out how it depends on n. So that's what we'll address right now.